and zoom in. And we are live. I will turn off my camera and mute myself and you're good. Good evening, I'm Scott Harris, Executive Director of Museums at the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this program by one of our institutions, the James Monroe Museum. It is a virtual conversation with the museum's namesake, President James Monroe. Through a mystical and technically unexplainable process, we will be reaching back 200 years to April 28, 1821, to speak with our nation's fifth chief executive. Before I introduce our guests, I want to thank the sponsors that make possible all of the public programs that are presented annually by the James Monroe Museum. And these are the Fredericksburg Savings Charitable Trust, the Paul and Jane Jones Trust, administered by our good friend, Walter J. Sheffield. The Stuart Jones Charitable Trust, administered by Truist Wealth, which we were very happy to hear today, has uh, made a substantial gift to our museums. And to the friends of the James Monroe Museum, we greatly appreciate the help of all of these folks. Uh, now, uh, for Mr. Monroe, this is not the, the last time that I'm going to say some things that will really be very confusing to him, so I ap apologize. Uh, I want to remind our audience on Facebook Live that you may post questions for President Monroe throughout the conversation in the comments section to the right of your screen. And our public programs coordinator, Lindsay Crawford, who is administering the live broadcast, will collate these questions, pass them on to me to pose to our guest. And we promise to get to as many as our time allows. We do ask that you make them as succinct and on topic as possible. And now to introduce our special guest. James Monroe was born on this very day, April 28th, in the year 1758 in Westmoreland County, Virginia. During the Revolutionary War, he left his studies at the College of William and Mary to be commissioned a lieutenant in the 3rd Virginia Infantry Regiment of the Continental Army. Mr. Monroe fought in several battles, notably the Battle of Trenton on December 26, 1776. In this engagement against Hessian mercenaries fighting for Great Britain, he helped capture an artillery battery, receiving a near fatal wound from a musket ball that remained in his body ever after. He ended his military service in 1780 as a lieutenant colonel. After studying law with Virginia Governor Thomas Jefferson, Mr. Monroe embarked upon a remarkably varied political career. Before reaching the age of 30, he was a member of the Governor's Council of State and the Virginia House of Delegates and the United States Congress. He established a law practice here in Fredericksburg in 1786, shortly after marrying Elizabeth Courtright of New York. During almost three years residence in Fredericksburg, Mr. Monroe served on the city's common council, uh, a second term in the House of Delegates and on Virginia's ratifying convention for the United States Constitution. In subsequent years, Mr. Monroe was a United States Senator from Virginia and American Minister to France, Great Britain, and Spain. Perhaps his most notable diplomatic achievement was negotiating the Louisiana Purchase Treaty with France in 1803, which dramatically increased the size of the United States. His other federal level offices include Secretary of State and for a while simultaneously Secretary of War in the administration of President James Madison. Mr. Monroe succeeded Mr. Madison when he was elected as our fifth president in 1816. And he was reelected uh, with only one dissenting electoral college vote uh, in 1820. As president, Mr. Monroe made three highly successful regional tours of the country in 1817, 1818, and 1819. He was also deeply involved in the Missouri Compromise the legislative confrontation over Missouri's admission to the Union that brought into dramatic focus the issue of slavery and the future of that institution in the United States. In addition to the vast number of other offices that he has held, James Monroe was also elected to one-year terms as governor of Virginia uh, four times by the General Assembly, 
in uh, 1799, 1800, and 1801, and then once more in 1811. And because Virginia, in our own time of 2021, is once more engaged in an election campaign for governor and for other state offices, we will focus our conversation this evening on uh, Mr. Monroe's gubernatorial record, primarily. As we shall see, certain events that occurred during Governor Monroe's time in office foreshadowed events and issues of our own time. So James Monroe, welcome and happy 263rd birthday. Mr. Harris, Madam Crawford, I am very honored to be here this evening, very different venue for me. And I'm very humbled by the kind words regarding my 63rd birthday. I'm not so comfortable about the 263rd, <laughs> but be that as it may, your well wishes are, are, are deeply appreciated. Thank you, sir. Thank well, you. Uh, you, you were very welcome, sir. As we say, we're asking for a little suspension of reality, uh, perhaps for some, but uh, as, as we say, it's a mystical and technically unexplainable process. And so we just ask people to uh, enjoy the ride. Um, I do note that you are in uh, the president's house and that you are in the Oval Parlor. We call that the Blue Room. I will give you a little bit of a hint about the future today. Um, and notice a very handsome portrait on the wall over your right shoulder. Oh, well, thank you. Mr. Morris is to be complimented for his um, good work. Yes, yeah, Samuel F.B. Morris, uh, I believe 1819 came uh, and uh, you sat for him, although you were a, uh, a frequently in, uh, interrupted uh, um, sitter uh, for that. Indeed. I believe it was a little bit of a challenge for him to be able to, to, be able to paint you with all the <laughs> demands of your office, but uh, we're glad that he was able to. Indeed, thank you. As I noted in the introduction, uh, here in 2021, from our vantage point, Virginia uh, will be electing a governor this year. And we do it differently uh, from uh, your era uh, in that we now have the entire uh, population of registered voters participating in the process. And that includes people of all races and even women who may participate regardless uh, of, of their place in society. Uh, it was very different in your day, was it not? quite different in my day. Um, only white male property owners were allowed to vote in my time. Um, and in addition, uh, we had uh, one year terms. I could serve potentially up to three years, and I did, uh, consecutive one year terms as governor. So things have evidently are very different from your vantage point, sir. Uh, indeed, they are. I'll ask Lindsay to bring up the first of several images that we'll be sharing during this conversation and um, uh, show a building that would be very familiar to you, mm -hmm. the state capital of Virginia. And I believe, can you see that, Mr. Monroe, uh, I can, sir, from I your vantage can. point? <laughs> I, I sur surely can, and I, I've been in and out of that building quite often. <laughs> Um, it, it, like many things, as we say, we're not going to give you the full uh, uh, preview here, but uh, we can say there have been alterations, but the essential nature of the design has remained the same, and it is still the seat of government for the Commonwealth, uh, and of course would be where those elections uh, for your terms uh, took place. Mm. Um, as we uh, go through uh, some parts of your, your gubernatorial record, I, I, I want to... Uh, again point out for the audience that we we uh, live in a, a in a very different time as we look back to that of james monroe and and there were divisions within society there were classifications of citizens uh those free and those enslaved that were fundamental to understanding those times and what some of the issues were that drove what was going on and we will address some of that but there is also uh something happening in this era that uh, has a very uh, uh, strong connection to what our uh, uh, time of 2021 has, uh, uh, has experienced. Um, and although you, Mr. Monroe, and other governors of the time were elected by such a small portion of the population, the performance of your duties involved the entire Commonwealth and all persons living within it. And one fact of life near time was frequent outbreaks of infectious diseases and the need to uh, act decisively to maintain public health. Now, here in 2021, uh, Virginia, the United States, really the whole world has been profoundly impacted uh, by uh, a global pandemic of an aggressive respiratory virus. We have seen 
tremendous loss of life, economic dislocation, especially for working families and the poor, uh, disruption of education for young people, and uh, sometimes a very contentious debate over just what the right role of government is in dealing with this crisis. You faced a similar challenge uh, in August of 1800, as you had to deal uh, during your first term of governor with an outbreak of fever, and wonder if you could uh, just talk about that somewhat. I'll ask Lindsay to, to go to the, the next image, please. Surely. Um, oh, happy to expound on that. Uh, in July of 1800, I was notified that a discovery had been made of a yellow fever outbreak in your city, your town of Fredericksburg. That was traced to the port of Norfolk. Quickly, we made arrangements um, to quarantine any watercraft, no matter how small, no matter how large, coming into that port and leaving for other ports in Virginia that include Alexandria, Fredericksburg, Richmond, Petersburg, and Williamsburg. And leaving for those ports and also leaving Norfolk to go to other destinations, the country and overseas as well, and trying to contain what uh, is a very deadly disease. Uh, and I will tell you a little bit about uh, my experience, uh, family's experience, personal experience from previously in 1793, dealing with an earlier outbreak of yellow fever, which was much worse. But we were able to contain this by establishing a system of examination sites at each of those ports so that for those ships coming in uh, and those individuals who became symptomatic with yellow fever, be it civilian, be it Navy, naval and, and, and uh, nature, that they would be um, put through um, examination and also be able to be housed on a associate housing near the examination site so that all those that were exposed and became symptomatic would be treated so we could curtail and end this, um, this plight. Uh, and that was successful. Um, the, the quarantine went to effect in August 23rd of 1800 and ended in November 4th. In Norfolk, only 250 individuals, 3% of the population died. And if you look back into what happened in Philadelphia in 1793 with the outbreak of yellow fever and the inability to curtail through proper precautions, the spread of that disease, 5,000 people of the 50,000 population of Philadelphia succumbed. That's uh, 10%. So there was a uh, substantial reduction in cont this contagion. And it's important, my primary responsibility as chief executive of the Commonwealth of Virginia is the public good, public safety. So this is of utmost, uh, an utmost imperative to, to end this scourge um, upon the land. So, um, In fact, in, in, in dealing with this crisis, you issued a proclamation, which we show a, a newspaper uh, clipping of at that point. But I wonder if you might read what, uh, what you uh, announced be, to the Commonwealth. Be happy to. I'll be happy to. Um, I said at the time, Whereas satisfactory information has been received that some contagious disease exists at Norfolk, which without due precaution may be communicated to other parts of the Commonwealth. And it being the duty of the executive to prevent the spreading of the said disease by causing the laws made and provided for that purpose to be faithfully executed, I have therefore thought fit with the advice of the Council of State to issue this proclamation in joining all vessels coming from the said port of Norfolk up James River to perform quarantine at Jordan's Point and all other vessels coming from said port to any other port within this Commonwealth to perform quarantine at the places there heretofore designated for such ports respectfully, respectively for the term of 15 days to be computed from the time they se severally sailed from the said Port of Norfolk. And what I find interesting in, in how you responded to this, how the state government apparatus responded, is that you, you as you say, first learned of this uh, outbreak in Fredericksburg, in the mm -hmm. town where you had lived, where 
where we're coming from now. And uh, we're eventually able to determine that the outbreak had originated in Norfolk. Today, as we deal with infectious disease transmission uh, and containment, we use the term contact tracing. It strikes me that you're essentially doing that uh, back in 1800 in, in attempting to get to the source of the problem. Um, I also note that a number of the things, whether it be quarantine or, or inspections, we, we have seen and, and, and it's become a, a familiar fact of life for a lot of citizens today as we work our way through our, our own pandemic emergency. So um, I, I think though that you as governor in 1800 were, were in a fairly limited position with the way that the state constitution read. So you, you were taking some fairly decisive executive action, I think, in, in undertaking this, but did that cause you any concern at all that you were maybe going outside the, the definition of your office? I think the potential fatalities dealing with the disease just completely uh, became uh, utmost uh, fear in my mind and that for the good of the public and public safety, it was necessary to um, be very proactive and pursue means to uh, end um, the spread of contagion. Um, uh, I, I think that as we um, go through some of the major events of your, your terms as governor at this time, and, and we, we will be talking about some others in just a moment, I, I want to take a moment too and reflect on the fact that while, while there was a, a great deal being accomplished and a great many important momentous events of state occurring, your family endured a personal tragedy during this period that um, I, I'm, I'm loath to bring it up, but I want people to understand that you were, you were uh, carrying out your duties under considerable personal strain. If you're, if you're comfortable uh, uh, addressing what happened to your family during that period, I, I know people would be, be interested to know. That's a fair question, and I'm glad you asked it. it. It was a tumultuous time for the citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia and for my family personally um, in 1800 at, in August of that year. Um, my young son, James Spence Monroe, only um, 18 months old, passed on September 18th of 1800. So during the efforts that my staff and those, so the General Assembly and all those connected with trying to uh, contain the yellow fever epidemic. Uh, I was also having to deal with the struggles to, to help my very ailing son. And when doctors informed my wife and I that there was no hope for, um, for him, uh, all we could do is to make him comfortable and then persevere on and do the best we could until his passing um, at only 18 months. Uh, it's a great loss. Um, great sadness runs through my family. And still at this time, I look back um, 21 years now almost to that time. And um, I have wonderful brief memories of him, but the, the pain is still there and it never goes away with the loss of a child. And, and for those who've lost a child or lost a member of the family, I'm sure they can well understand. So thank you. I, uh, his memory lives on in the Monroe family and we will endeavor to um, do good in the world. And for our and I know you, you, you and Mrs. Monroe take great uh, comfort from uh, your daughters, uh, Eliza and Mariah and their families as they- Those uh, young ladies are the light of our lives and their families are as well. And they send, by the way, I, I, I apologize to uh, you and uh, Madam Crawford and the audience for not extending their regards, they told me to, to pass on their regards from the White House, um, uh, the federal city and, and their regards uh, to all of you all and hoping that you be well and be safe. And, and thank you for, for um, being part of this conversation. So uh, all is well with the Monroe family there and um, thank you for asking. Much appreciated. I know the work goes on and uh, it does. trying to uh, <laughs> refurbish the house. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we may hear strange noises that might emanate from the background once in a while. <laughs> I think we have Workman already. And others are coming through or peacocks loose on the lawn. They start uh, mm -hmm. uttering their cries. Um, during your gubernatorial administration, Virginia continued work uh, that had begun under your predecessor, James Wood, 
uh, on two major construction projects, the uh, State Manufactory of Arms or Arsenal uh, and the State Penitentiary. And the penitentiary particularly uh, was um, more than, than simply a, a, a place of incarceration. It really was a symbol of a reform movement underway in the United States in this era. Um, but I, I also realize I'm getting ahead of myself on one uh, area, and I'm going to apologize and ask Lindsay to go to the next image that we have been sharing. Uh, forgive me for having gotten ahead. Uh, th this, again, Mr. Mo Monroe, a little bit of a peek forward that you would not have known of. This is a, uh, a newspaper from much later after uh, uh, the time we're speaking now, uh, around 1890 in Virginia. But I think that you will see the more things might change, the more they're the same, because there's yellow fever once again breaking out once again. Mm -hmm. uh, in the century. And, and the same sorts of reactions of tracing it to Hampton Roads and seeing uh, the um, uh, reaction of the authorities in Richmond. So again, mm -hmm. my apologies for kind of forgetting about that image, but um, it, it is something that, that uh, has, has been a factor over time that we've dealt with. Now, Lindsay, if you'll proceed to the next image and I'll try to stay on point here. Um, two major construction projects, as I mentioned, the manufacturing of arms, which is pictured here um, uh, uh, as, it, uh, as it was completed. Um, and then also with the next image, uh, we see uh, one of the drawings um, in the next image, Lindsay, if you would, um, of the state penitentiary uh, designed by Benjamin Henry Latrobe. And as I said, representing a, an effort toward uh, some reforms in uh, the administration of prisons and, and the treatment of prison prisoners, excuse me. I um, wonder if you could uh, de describe the role that you played as governor in these uh, two construction projects. Well, certainly I would like to, to add that my mentor and the third president of the United States, um, President Jefferson, had a lot to do with the reform, prison reform, and his ideas concerning this particular uh, building uh, were passed on uh, from myself, um, to myself, and um, uh, to Mr. Latrobe as well uh, for his efforts in building um, a model reformatory of a penitentiary of sorts um, there off of the James River. Um, the building itself, um, um, the superintendent, uh, John Clark and I had extensive correspondence. Mr. Clark was a noted mill, excuse me, um, um, Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Callis, uh, Thomas Callis, um, I was actually involved with this particular building uh, as the superintendent. And we had extensive correspondence with this particular building. Um, uh, and Mr. Clark, of course, John Clark was superintendent of, of other public buildings. Exactly. Yeah, and he was also the, you know, probably more Arsenal. so. Uh, well, as much with the arsenal as with uh, right. The exactly. Building. There was a, a change in the guard, so to speak, with uh, um, at some point with the two superintendents. Mm -hmm. But um, Mr. Clark more so with the arsenal. Um, but the prison um, and the Virginia manufacture of arms were of great concern to me. Again things dealing with public good, public safety, um, and making sure that we had um, adequate means uh, to address um, the concerns of the public regarding uh, those that need to be imprisoned and also the safety of the Commonwealth. Um, regarding the Virginia manufacture of arms, the state militia had issues with being properly equipped and the two federal uh, armories, one in Springfield, Massachusetts, and the other in Harpers Ferry, Virginia, were unable to meet the demand that we needed to uh, meet the equipping of our soldiers with the militia here in, in the Commonwealth. Um, so um, we set up our own arsenal, so to speak. I'll ask uh, Lindsay to go back to that previous image, if she would. Exactly. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Those are really interesting uh, paintings of those particular building sites. Um, as you mentioned, Mr. Woods, the former governor, initiated this in 1798. Uh, it was completed, the arsenal was completed in 1801. It began operations in 1802, uh, primarily devoted to uh, the production of muskets, pistols, swords. By 1809, they were in cannon production and also producing ordnance. Um, we had sent Mr. Clark, again, the superintendent, here at the Virginia Manufacturing Arms up to uh, Springfield 
uh, to learn um, for as much as he could and to bring back um, um, model um, um, evidence and uh, you know to help supply design information or uh, for the creation of our own arsenal in in Virginia. So he was very very uh, active in those pursuits. And the arsenal has been very productive. Although this year we'll note we're still we're having an economic downturn um, in 1821. I understand Virginia and the manufacturing is not doing what it did back in those early years, 20 years ago. But suffice it to say, it uh, was state of the art um, and operated uh, with this experienced millwright, um, Mr. Clark, at its helm. You said that he had um, uh, gotten a good deal of counsel and, and assistance from the. Uh... The director of the Springfield Armory, uh, up to a point. Up to a point, he did exactly. Um, he had made frequent visits, visits, excuse me, to to Springfield, and finally, the superintendent there noticed that um, some of his um, skilled craftsmen in the arsenal were interested in perhaps relocating to Richmond to work for Mr. Clark, and he basically asked uh, Mr. Clark not to come to his uh, armory anymore. <laughs> so, ended that um, exercise, but we had learned as much as we could. And I think that uh, the efforts of um, modeling our own arsenal were, came to fruition and were very productive when we had the state-of-the-art facility. If we uh, can go back to the uh, image now forward, I guess I should say, of the uh, uh, prison again. Um, yes. One thing uh, that uh, it's my understanding, and I, I don't know whether you could uh, comment further on this or not, not mm -hmm. being directly your area of expertise, um, the the intention of the time uh, uh, of establishment of this um, penitentiary and, 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 and even the name penitentiary, a penance, um, there, there was a feeling that solitary confinement and contemplation were the uh, ways to uh, bring uh, an offender back to a, a more productive frame of mind to re-enter society, um, and that uh, by constructing uh, an edifice that would be largely of, of solitary, solitarily confined, if that's a word, um, uh, inmates or prisoners, that that uh, that would be part of the, the, the reform philosophy. Um, I think that that there are a number of different ways in which those thoughts evolved, even in the twenty years or so that. Uh, the, from from your vantage point there, and certainly in our vantage point much later, that we've gone through a lot of evolutions of looking at prison reform. Mm -hmm. um, I might note, and of course, the death penalty was applied uh, in your time, and we will discuss that in a moment. But um, mm -hmm. since we're talking about the penitentiary, uh, again, a little glimpse of the future for you, sir. Um, in this year of 2021, the Commonwealth of Virginia, uh, after a long history of, uh, of uh, staging public execution, executions have, in fact, uh, has decided to end that practice. And so there's a milestone that we have reached in our approach to that. Congratulations. That's, um, I know that's a very progressive um, end result um, and a big change in how we um, work with those that are incarcerated uh, for, severe, for severe crimes and um, as you mentioned, I, I, the, the, the term penitentiary is an interesting one, and again, Jefferson and others have had a lot to do with this, but it was, uh, it was a model um, place for hopefully turning around those incarcerated for crime. So um, we're happy that um, that came to uh, completion actually in 1804, the final completions um, stage, um, and has been uh, an active part of our society for reforming uh, prisoners. Um, I'd like now, sir, if we could, to go back uh, to that um, very challenging, difficult summer of 1800 um, mm -hmm. uh, that we've already discussed with the, the pandemic, with the person who lost your family. And, and even as those events are occurring, yet another momentous uh, event uh, situation mm -hmm. is arising in the summer of 1800 in Virginia. Uh, as the Commonwealth was was dealing with the yellow fever outbreak, um, you also had um, a, uh, as it turned out, abortive uprising of enslaved people led by a man named Gabriel, uh, mm -hmm. a blacksmith who was held in bondage by a Henrico County plantation owner named Thomas Prosser. 
Sometimes, in fact, Gabriel is called Gabriel Prosser, although that was never a, an actual given name. But Gabriel, um, who was literate, who was imbued with ideas, really inspired by your friend, Mr. Jefferson, by Patrick Henry and the revolutionary rhetoric uh, of the Revolutionary War, uh, planned an uprising of other enslaved persons in the Richmond area primarily with the goal of securing their freedom. Can you describe uh, generally the events of that time and what uh, occurred in uh, the, uh, the uprising that, that some have called Gabriel's Rebellion? It, it was a, a very, very trying time. As I mentioned, as we previously talked about the yellow fever epidemic and then my personal family's struggles with the, um, our, our son, um, then in this mix was this, this situation that arose. Um, I will tell you that on August 30th, Gabriel and his fellow conspirators had planned to advance towards Richmond in three waves, um, to, um, which included, by the way, to capture myself and hold me uh, as a hostage uh, without harm. Uh, Gabriel and, and his uh, fellow slaves actually viewed um, the fact that I supported um, the French view of liberty and um, equality, um, so much so that they valued uh, uh, my life. And that was part of their plan was to take me as a hostage. Unfortunately for them, um, unfortunately for the Commonwealth, a severe storm arose that night that um, created a lot of flooding and it was impossible to navigate and to move um, people through that. Um, so the slaves actually planned to postpone that insurrection into the following day. Now, that night, the night of August 30th, two slaves who had been party to the conversation that Gabriel and his fellow slaves had been having about forming this movement to um, you know, claim their freedom and move towards Richmond. Their names were Tom and Pharaoh. And Tom and Pharaoh uh, went to um, a man named Mosby Shepherd. Mosby Shepherd was a fellow farmer near the plantation of Brookfield. Brookfield is the place where Gabriel um, lived. On this. Let me, let me, if I may, sir, just bug. We're, we're trying to navigate our images. Uh, uh, Lindsay had anticipated me by bringing up an image of. Um, oh, certainly. An image used to portray Gabriel. We must say that he is not uh, someone for whom an, an actual credited image was ever created. But this is generally uh, used uh, uh, to represent what, uh, from descriptions, what Gabriel look like a large, powerfully built man. Um, uh, and this is, is depicting him essentially at the time of his capture. But you're mentioning Mosby Shepherd uh, and, and his uh, being made aware of this. If Lindsay will advance to the next image, we can show, in fact, a note uh, that he sent to you. Yes. I received that said note the following day by noon on the 31st. And at that point, um, I called out the militia. Um, and the militia moved the started to move the public arms located the Capitol into um, the penitentiary, and then the regiments that I called up also went on stationary patrol on the James River because it was intimated to me that several of the conspirators had association with bateaux, uh, canal transportation along the James, and so we were very worried about access along the James. Um, and through the effort of the um, of those the militia that had been called up, we were able to bring in the conspirators um, and including finally catching Gabriel. Gabriel was brought before me, um, actually near me. Um, um, I saw him from a distance um, being brought towards into the into the into Richmond on September 27th. Um, as an aftermath, um, Gabriel, two brothers, uh, and 24 others were, were, were um, executed for their crimes. Um, interesting enough, an associated rebellion took place in 1802 through an associate of Gabriel named Sancho. 
And that took place in Southern Virginia and uh, Northern North Carolina. And another 25 slaves, including Sancho, were executed. All told, 52 slaves perished because of insurrections based on their desire for freedom. Um, and uh, we should note that these were uh, trials that were carried out in front of magistrates, but not juries. And that was not an option that was available to people of color, certainly not to those who were enslaved at that time. And our purpose here is, is not to thoroughly examine the, the, the impact of this situation uh, as it reflects to our subsequent or, or current society. But I think it is important for us in this way in which we are sort of reaching back to a particular point in time, your time, mm -hmm. to at least indicate that um, Gabriel's uprising, what it represented, what uh, other events would come after uh, that would occur, in, in fact, sir, in many uh, points beyond uh, your time, um, continued to show the uh, impact on our nation, on our society, of the institution of slavery, of what that meant for people white and black, uh, what it meant for relations between the races, and, and what it would mean about the definition of uh, American society. And, and I, I can say that it uh, would be a, a source of many upheavals that we would see in history subsequent to your own, and they are issues we continue to wrestle with in our present day. Uh, that may all become the subject of another more focused conversation we may have with you in the future, but uh, for now we, we wanted to be able to point out that among the other things happening during your tumultuous really first term as governor, uh, that this was one of those major events uh, that was occurring. A sad moment in history, but I, I you couldn't have worded better, Scott. Um, thank you for sharing uh, those words. And I look forward to our future conversation. We can examine um, this on another day. I, I, I also want to uh, uh, apologize if I'm uh, looking a bit distracted here. There are some other uh, notations that are coming through that I'm dealing with. We, we, we live in a, uh, uh, an interesting technological society in, in 2021, and we, we try to keep up with everything. Um, we, we want to uh, open up uh, the conversation to some questions from uh, our audience at this time. Uh, and again, um, uh, Mr. Monroe, uh, I won't try and explain how we're doing this, but suffice it to say that there are people who have been watching and listening and who have found uh, the conversation uh, fascinating and, and would love to pose some additional questions to you. Now, now some of these um, mm -hmm. that are coming in uh, are not, in fact, most of them are more about your presidency than they are about uh, your governorship. But I do want to note that we did have, um, uh, there were questions coming in about just where the armory and the penitentiary were in Richmond um, uh, and in terms of where they are located. Uh, um, and uh, I'm not that good at Richmond's geography, but I believe that the uh, penitentiary occupied an area around South and Second Streets and the, the, the arsenal near Browns Island, does that sound yes. correct? Mm -hmm. You got the locations correct. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, you know, Richmond uh, being the capital of the Commonwealth uh, certainly evolved from the time William Byrd first uh, explore that area and when it became our capital and, and I can assure you it's continued to evolve uh, considerably uh, as time has gone on. Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, people of today in our time uh, may or may not be able to figure out where uh, some of these things are that we're talking about, but um, uh, suffice it to say they were very much a part of, of Richmond's uh, evolving architecture. Um, let me get back to some of the other questions here to uh, Sort of take them in order. Um, can you talk about uh, the time uh, in which you were simultaneously Secretary of War, uh, so, well, Secretary of State, and then also Secretary of War uh, under President Madison? Um, there was also some question about the undertaking uh, that you did to uh, scout the British uh, force in 1817 that was approaching the capital. So, a tumultuous time uh, during the War of 1812. It wasn't very I said 1817, but uh, mm -hmm. 1814. Mm -hmm. I was brought on board by President Madison in 1811 as Secretary of State, and then began serving as um, 
Secretary of War simultaneously in 1814, 1815. Um, I will tell you, interesting enough, as an aside, in 1815, I came down with something that may be attributed to yellow fever or sciatica. I'm not sure which of the two, but it occurred and it, it uh, did have an effect on me. I had lower back pain, which is a symptom of uh, yellow fever, but also it's also a symptom of advancing age too, I think. So- um, Surely not, surely not. <laughs> well, you're great, you're too kind. Um, <laughs> Madison knew, our being very good friends, I knew about my experience during the late war, uh, the previous war, the American Revolution, and, and, and knew that I would be a, a fitting substitute for the former Secretary of War, which he was very disappointed with in terms of his uh, performance when the threat of British invasion became apparent. I had uh, argued uh, vehemently that the Chesapeake Bay was the main entry point for a major British invasion and those words were not heeded and then it happened. And as you know, the Battle of Bladensburg ensued in August, 1814 and um, President Madison and I um, went to the field. I, um, he's the only president to date, um, well, there haven't been many, too many others beside me, but that has been in the field as, uh, you know, as an active president in the field of battle. And we are overlooking a artillery um, emplacement during the Battle of Bladensburg, which failed miserably, unfortunately. And we retreated back to Washington. And uh, thankfully for a major uh, storm that blew through, it put out many of the fires that were set by the British on public buildings, and as you know, they torched the Capitol, the president's house. Uh, they, uh, the British spared the patent office because the patent office keeper made a plea that all of the patents were private um, uh, models that were submitted. Uh, private property. Yeah. Pro exactly, and so the, the commanding British officer respected that and spared the patent office from, from being torched. But the flames did put out, um, uh, excuse me, the uh, storm did put out um, uh, the flames to a degree. Um, it did result in the death of some of the British soldiers. Um, we retreated out of Washington, as you all also know, the, the story of um, Mrs. Madison saving the, the famous Washington portrait while everything else pretty much was consumed, uh, except for paperwork that we had uh, luckily, gotten out of the White House, uh, the President's house, uh, and then ferried west for safekeeping, including all those important documents, um, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, of those that mm -hmm. uh, those uh, uh, of utmost importance in our nation's um, well for our nation's well-being. Um, well, in fact, because of the destruction of the Capitol, uh, you became the first president uh, to have your inauguration outside, out of doors. Indeed, indeed it was outside, exactly. Um, that first uh, one in 1817. So the second inauguration was inside due to a snowstorm, but uh, <laughs> that's another story for another day. Yeah, but indeed, uh, indeed. Um, those were momentous times um, in uh, a city that uh, has grown quite a bit um, since um, that August 1814 invasion by the British. But um, we have now, as you know, we refurbished the, the, the citizenry of the United States, we have thankfully refurbished uh, residence so that my family and I can reside while we're working here in Washington. And it's a lovely building, as we all know, an important building, a symbol of our, um, of, um, of our chief executive, myself, and of um, the role that we play in um, performing our duties to you and the citizens of our country. Well, as you fulfill that executive role as president and as you fulfilled it as governor, one of our questions has to do with, uh, uh, and I'm sure you will agree with this, a question about your beautiful wife. Um, what were her activities, uh, particularly when you were governor? Because I, I don't know that we had, unlike the presidency, the, the concept of, of, of a first lady of, of the Commonwealth, I don't think had as much of a uh, of, of a semi-official status as it would evolve, uh, started with General Washington going forward mm -hmm. in the presidency, but there were still social uh, events and, and activities and, and, and other ways in which uh, your wife uh, would have been a part of what was happening in that time. Can you, can you speak to that? You're very kind and your, your uh, listener who submitted the question and uh, I, I commend them and thank them for their 
very nice remarks about my wife, uh, the Belle American, um, referred to it by the French for her for her beauty. I don't. I'm very fortunate to uh, to be in a partnership of sorts with her. Um, but he, here at that time in um, during my three years consecutive years as governor of Virginia, um, her health was not as um, uh, good as we would like to have been, and especially with our son for from 1799 to 1801, um, um, we were limited in what she could do to assist in fulfilling um, a role uh, of support uh, in terms of social um, uh, events, uh, being a representative uh, along my side. So her her time, unfortunately, um, and necessarily so, was devoted to the caretaking of our son. So, um, and then, and then the, the aftermath, tragedy, as we discussed. The tra exactly. And then, then, then his death um, uh, affected uh, both of us deeply uh, um, and it took some time. So I will say that our time in, in Richmond, um, those first three years were difficult ones. Um, there are some good memories, but there were tumultuous times too as well. So there wasn't much time for her to uh, spend uh, by my side in an official capacity, but I know she wanted otherwise, but it wasn't meant to be. Should mention too, and we, we said at the very outset that you were elected four times governor. Four times Virginia, actually. Three consecutively. Mm -hmm. And then in 1811, uh, there was one other election, which could have conceivably put you on path for a, yet another three, but um, other other events intervened. Exactly. I served two months and then sec uh, President Madison asked if I would like to be Secretary of State. And so off I went from Richmond to to the federal city, Washington. Well, unfortunately, your quarters as governor were, were not very good. Uh, and that was one thing the Commonwealth had not quite figured out how to do yet, provide for a suitable residence for the governor. But uh, if your only uh, or your fourth term could be remain for only one thing, um, we might say that it would be uh, uh, or might be remembered for uh, one of the, the official actions you did take at that time, approving the construction of a governor's residence. In the exactly. Mansion, which regrettably you never got to live in. Never got to live in, but it was built that year. So it was um, I'm, I'm very really, nice. You know, still use it. <laughs> this is good to hear. In it fact, uh, again, tipping, tipping you off to the future, uh, the Virginia Executive Mansion remains the longest continuously used executive residence of a governor of uh, any state in the nation. And we've added a few since your time. I won't tell you how many, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, it continues to serve. And so you, you among your other legacies, is that residence for uh, the governors of our Commonwealth. Um, I'm going to try and run back here again. Now, we're, we're, we have questions gratifyingly all over your career, and I'm trying to keep them as uh, uh, consecutively uh, uh, linked here as possible. Going, going back, um, and, and we didn't really speak to this as much. In fact, there's uh, some other programming our museum's done about this. You uh, were close in various ways to um, three of your predecessors, um, people who, in fact, uh, were um, like yourself, uh, Virginians and presidents of the United States, uh, George Washington, uh, and then Thomas Jefferson. Um, we, we took a pause with Mr. Adams, uh, but then resumed with Virginians with Mr. Jefferson, Mr. Madison, then yourself. One might say a, a, a dynasty of Virginians, mm -hmm. right? Virginia dynasty, perhaps. Within your relationships with those men, how would you? You know, just briefly characterize each and, and what they what their impact on your life and career were. Washington was very much like a father um, during that period of time of the American Revolution when I was wounded as a um, lieutenant at the Battle of Trenton in 1776 and then subsequently promoted to captain, eventually made to major. Um, he took note of um, my efforts there, um, was very humbled by his attention. Um, Told you a brave and sensible officer. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I was lucky to survive that um, wounding there in Trenton and thankfully to Dr. Riker saving my life. Um, um, the, as, as many of your listeners probably, probably know that um, President Washington and I had a falling out of sorts. Um, over my role 
as ambassador to France, minister to France. Mm -hmm. um, I will tell you to make this concise and short that when Washington, about the time that Washington passed in 1799 and I was serving as governor, I, I had hoped um, that perhaps we could um, meet and talk. We, we had not um, had um, kind words since um, the mid 1790s, 17, uh, since my return from France and Washington. Um, I wrote a, I wrote a uh, defense of my role um, in that country on behalf of the United States and Washington took issue with that. Um, and I know that many of your avid uh, history readers or listeners here may know that the, about the extensive notes that Washington made in his own personal copy of my book, defending my, my, my book, defending my position in France. So um, I, I feel now um, 22 years removed after his death, personally that uh, Washington was an incredible um, figure in our nation's history and the father of our country. And I hope, um, I know that I've come to terms in peace with uh, my relationship with him. And I hope that things were turned out better near the end, but it didn't. So that was an important relationship, father to son of sorts at that time. Your working period. relationship, more, something more like peer to peer, much more so with Mr. Jefferson, and Mr. Madison, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, Jefferson and I met, um, of course, when I was assigned, when I returned to William & Mary um, in 1780, um, uh, I also assumed uh, command of the Virginia Garrison Regiment to protect Williamsburg from possible British threats. Uh, we met when he was governor um, and then, um, of course, um, moved to Richmond to study law under him, continue my reading of law under him. So he was not only, he was in a father way, fatherly like way to me as well, but also a teacher, a mentor, um, and sort of guided my career from my desire had always been to be a professional military, um, be in the military as a profession. And when it became very clear that there were no commands for me in the American Revolution that could continue my career post-Revolutionary War, um, this was an opportunity for me to, to uh, seek gainful employment in an area that perhaps I would be have some modicum of success in, and Jefferson saw that. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have been in his presence and to have worked with him and for him to have guided me all these years. Madison and I also had, a, as you mentioned, had an excellent working relationship and friendship. Um, we also ran into each other literally um, in participating, um, um, actually competing against one another um, for political um, appointments, but uh, political office. But, uh, and at, during that time um, as well, we had moments where our friendship uh, waxed and waned, but uh, he was a great friend, a brilliant mind, just like Jefferson. So all three, all told, had fairly uh, um, uh, characteristics that were important to my growing as a person, as an individual, as a citizen of the United States, and then also in my roles in elected office and were important to um, for their friendship as well, even though there were times that um, were better than others. They were well, great I, I, might, I might say from, from, again, drawing off one of the questions really that's come up, um, your relationship with, with Jefferson was, was very much that of a mentor, not, not so much a father figure, might, one might say maybe an older brother figure perhaps or something, mm -hmm. but definitely the catalyst for bringing you and, and Madison together. But Yes. As you assume the presidency, uh, uh, my understanding is that you, uh, how would one say this? Um, it, it, when confronted with a request from Mr. Jefferson for, for making an appointment to office, you demonstrated that perhaps the, the mentorship was uh, somewhat more in the past and that you were, you were prepared to go your own way. Uh, is that a, that's true. a fair way of approaching the subject? That's, 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 um, a very good take on my evolving of my um, ideology, my my method of governing, and so there were times of um, polite disagreement, or 
hopefully a polite disagreement. <laughs> Well, and, and I think that certainly um, uh, as, as your administration continues into its second term, there will be many issues upon which uh, you and both Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Madison will confer, as you certainly did during the Missouri crisis of the, the last year. Right. We, we, I conversed with those two gentlemen quite extensively, and they are, their opinions do matter to me, and I do listen. Um, <laughs> a question has come up that uh, I, I find intriguing. Uh, have you ever been involved in a duel? Close. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Would you, you, now, that's another one that we could take a long time talking about. This, this could take a long time. So, and I won't do that, but I will say that um, Mr. Hamilton and I had somewhat of an interesting um, go round, so to speak. But we never came to doing. But it um, more words than doing, or more words than physical uh, meeting and doing. But uh, partly through the intercession of Mr. Burr, uh, exactly. Ironically, given subsequent events, uh, exactly that uh, they would eventually meet and and Hamilton would fall. But um, um, I will say that Hamilton's accusations um, that I betrayed him in any way are completely false. I attempted to go to his wife in Washington uh, to um, meet with her and mm -hmm. to extend my regards and she would have none of that. And there we are. And, and, and there we are. And in fact, here we are reaching uh, basically the, the uh, point at which we will be concluding our program. I want to thank you very much, President Monroe, for speaking with us this evening. I'm afraid I'm now going to use some language again that will be a bit confusing to you, but uh, please bear with me. Uh, for our uh, watchers and listeners, a recording of this program will be archived on the James Monroe Museum's Facebook page and YouTube channel. And links to these and other educational resources are available at the Hands-On History page of the museum's website, which is www.jamesmonroemuseum.com umw.edu. And so for the James Monroe Museum and the University of Mary Washington, we want to thank both President James Monroe and the best James Monroe interpreter in the business, Mr. Jay Harrison, for our virtual conversation this evening. And Lindsay, thank you for helping us navigate through the, the technical ineptitude that I was displaying uh, earlier in the program. Uh, but thank you, Jay. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, thank you both. Audience, thank you as well. And uh, have a pleasant evening. The same to you all.